Okay, are we recording now, Jeff? Yes, we are. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Stephen Feuerstein's Oracle Developer Advocate Team. Our job is to help you get the best out of the Oracle database. Um, my particular focus is on SQL, and with that in mind, I'm looking at one of my favorite new features in Oracle 12C, that's temporal validity. This is a great feature to make it easier to work with queries where you're working on um, date-based queries. If you want to reach out to me to get in touch about this or anything else related to SQL, you can email me at chris.saxon at oracle.com or tweet me at Chris R. Saxon. I also have a Twitter account where I post daily tips on using SQL uh, at SQL Daily, so follow that for your daily dose of SQL. Okay, so with that in mind, um, let's get started. So, just introduce the problem. It's quite a common requirement to introduce changes, to capture changes to your data over time. So you're not just updating your information, you keep the full version history. So for example, if we have a simple scheme which is stores information about people and their addresses, if I move house, rather than just updating my address to the new, be the new location, we'll insert a new row with the new address. Now, we've got the new information, but we also need to capture information about when I moved so that we know when the changes occurred. And one way of doing this is introducing start and end date columns to the table, which say when I moved in and when I moved out. This enables us to look back in time and see how information was at the point in the past. So for example, if we want to know where I lived in 2005, we can just run a query and find where 2005 is between the start and end date and we'll get this row, I'm at the Shire there. So why would you want to use this? There's a number of reasons. Um, first up, you may, be, you may need to for auditory or regulatory reasons. So you may have compliance issues that you have, which means you need to store history of all changes to your data for over a past period of time, past five or six years or something like that. Um, so secondly, you may also want to use it to kind of future date changes. So changes come in automatically. Say you've got a product pricing application and you want the changes to come in at midnight tonight. One way you can do that is have a scheduled job or someone run a script at midnight with the new time. The alternative is, you have a product table with a start and end date, uh, and the new price begins at midnight. This means you can preload the data, check it's all right, and as long as your query is only returning the rows where the current date is between the start and the end, the prices will kick in automatically when you get to that time. Uh, any of you who work with uh, data warehouses will also be quite familiar with slowly changing dimensions, which typically have effective from and to date columns on them to keep the full version history of the changes. And I'm gonna use that as an example today to talk through this in more detail. So at this point, I'm gonna bring up a data modeler. I've got simple star schema that I've got for a data warehouse for a typical retail company that's got physical shops. So we want to know information about who's buying what, where, and when. And the sales fact table just joins those all together so we've got the information. Now the shops, products, and customers tables I've implemented as slowly changing dimensions. So if we're in a situation where product price has changed, rather than overwriting the prices, we close off the old row by setting the effective to date, insert a new row with the new prices in and set the effective from date. Now, my boss has now come to me and given me a question. He says, I want to find all the sales that happened on or after the 1st of January this year. However, for sales after the 1st of January, the values for the dimensions must be the same as they were on the 1st of January. 
So for example, if we've got a product whose price changed on the 5th of January, we don't want the sales for it on or after the 5th, but we do want sales on the 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th. So to write this query, we need to find all the rows where the 1st of January is between these from and two dates. However, before we can do that, there's a few questions we need to answer. First up, how have we actually stored the effective from and to dates? Does the end date, so the to date of one row, correspond with the exact same time of the from date of the next row? Or is there a gap between them, a defined period such as a day? So we need to know what the boundary conditions are so we can write our inequalities correctly. Second thing we need to know is how do we manage currently active rows? There's a couple of ways which are typically used. One is to say that the effective to date of null indicates that the row is currently active. Um, another approach which I commonly see is people use a magic date in the far flung future, something like 31st of December 3999, and use that to kind of say that these are active rows. So there's a few things we need to understand about our data before we can actually effectively write this query. Now in this example, I'm saying active rows have an effective two date of null and rows end and start at the same time. So the end date, the effective two date of one row is equal to the from date of the new row. And we go to SQL developer, I'll bring up the query here. So we can see we've got all our joins here, we're getting the number of sales and their value. But have a look at the where clause here. We can see this is, this is pretty complicated. We've got quite a few lines to express our condition to find the rows where the effective, where the 1st of January is between the effective from and to. And not only do we need to know how to do this, but it's, it's quite easy to make a mistake while actually writing this query. Um, it normally takes me at least two goes to get the inequalities correct for these kinds of queries, particularly if I haven't done them for a while. And not only that, it's pretty easy to make a silly mistake, for example, missing one of the equals out or putting it on the wrong inequality. This means that potentially we've got wrong information. So there's quite a lot of overhead you need to be aware of when you want to write queries to find the rows that were effective at a given point in time. You need to know how you're actually storing your data and what the boundary conditions are. And also, you just need to be careful and make sure you're checking your query carefully to ensure it returns the correct information. Um, it'd be great if there was an easy way to do it. Fortunately, in 12C and we implemented temporal validity, and this provides a much easier way of doing it. Instead of this kind of complicated walls I've got here, I can now just say, as of period four, effective, and which date I want to see the effective rows for. So if we compare, the original query we can out side query but I haven't actually defined what the if we go back to data modeler and have a look at that I will bring up the customers table and there's this valid time dimensions option in the table properties so I'll just create a new one and call it effective and then pick which columns make up that period. So the start of it is the effective from date, and the end of it is the effective to date. Now notice I can create multiple time periods on the table, multiple time dimensions. Why would I do that? Well, if we return to the address example we started with, um, there's a date you actually physically move house, and there's a date you inform the companies um, that you have services from when you moved house. So I actually moved house earlier this year. However, uh, 
there's quite a few companies that I didn't tell that I'd moved house until a few weeks, in some cases, a few months after I'd actually moved. So when, you're, when I'm telling the company that, it's useful for them to be able to record the date I actually moved, the real date, and the date I told them I moved, particularly if I'm buying services off them, which depend on my location. This can be very useful then if um, there's any disputes over billing. But for now, I'll just stick with the one effective period with these start and end columns. And just apply that and take a quick look at the DDL. So we can see now in the create table statement, we've got this extra clause here, this period for effective, with the effective from and to dates. With this period in place, the query I showed you previously will now um, return the correct information. However, you can see this is a create table. You may be wondering, well, can I just apply this to my existing tables? I'm sure many of you either are working on or have worked on databases where you've already got various effective from and to date on them. And you don't want to have to rebuild your tables, particularly if they're very large ones. Fortunately, just go back to SQL Developer, you can define the, these periods on existing tables through a simple alter table statement. So we can say alter table, whatever it is, add the period, give it a name, whatever you want to call it, and the columns that make it up. So if I now do that and add those in, and I'll just save my previous results. When I execute my query now, we'll see that we've got different results. We got the results we wanted. These now match the results we had in my original query. How has it done this? Well, let's just take a quick look at the explain plan. We'll bring it up. We can see that Oracle's automatically generated a whole bunch of predicates for us, which look quite a lot like the ones that we had in our original where clause. So by defining the period and then using this as of period for syntax, Oracle has actually generated the correct where clause for us. This is great because it simplifies the query significantly. You no longer need to spend time thinking about, uh, you know, which way around do I need my inequalities? Are they great than strictly greater than, greater than or equal to, and so on. All you need to remember is this as of period for syntax and know the name of the period. Oracle handles the rest for you. So we've got smaller queries, which are easier to write, which just makes your life a whole bunch easier. So just to recap, to finish up. So I really like temporal validity. It's a great way to simplify your queries. To use it, you first need to define your time periods on your query, on your tables. If you've got existing tables, which I'm sure many of you do, you can just do an alter table, add period for, whatever you want to call it. Then to use temporal validity in your actual queries, you reference the period, the period name in the query itself. And this comes after the table name. So we have table name as a period for what it's called and the date you want it for. That can be a specific date, 1st of January, or if you want the currently active rows, you can say sys date and um, that will keep up to date, and so you'll see the current information. Finally, as I said, you need to be on Oracle 12C to make use of it, so if you're looking for a reason to upgrade, here's a good one. Um, so that's pretty much it for this. I'm gonna be hanging around for some questions now, as Jeff said. If you've got any, please let us know in the chat. Thanks for watching.